hope you all had a lovely lunch. As always, the bowl puts on such a delightful spread. That was an amazing amount of food, wasn't it, everyone? Yeah. A uh, nice round of applause for the bowl. I'm Lynn Podian. I am the chair of the Business Advocacy Committee, and I'm also your hostess. Um, if I, we always do this at every time, so just so you know, um, can I have all of our Business Advocacy Committee members please raise your hand? That way you can look around the room, and if there's any questions, any concerns, any needs you have, and you feel more comfortable directly talking to one of us, we are always willing and able to have those conversations with you. Um, Bill is going to take my picture. I'm going to smile. Otherwise, I'll have my mouth staying open, right? <laughs> ah, there's Lynn again. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. You made me look thinner, right? Okay, good. That's all that matters. Um, Prevea. Where's Kelly? Where's Kelly? Thank you. Kelly is um, with Prevea, and Prevea always does such a wonderful job hosting our meal here. So thank you to Prevea. We have a few little committee member notes for you today. Um, you'll notice on your table there is this wonderful marketing programming item. Please make sure you take one. If you hopefully are getting these at your business, um, I know personally we got two this, this week and we were very excited about it. It gives you a nice rundown on everything from now until June 18th. There is one small item that is missing from this, and I believe um, business members uh, from Advocacy help me out. I, it's April 14th at 1.30 is our ribbon cutting. Yes, right? Okay. April 14th at, at the uh, ribbon cutting over at the brand new, uh, now see, look at that. I just ran out of words. John, help me. Air Quality Monitoring Station. I really do know what I'm talking about, but when it's not written down and I'm talking to all of you at once, it's a little overwhelming. So, Air Quality Monitoring Station. For those of you who don't know, um, we've been working for a number of years to try and make sure that your air quality is actually where it should be. So this air quality station is um, its a temporary right now, but we're doing a ribbon cutting out there, and we'd love to have all of you come and join us if you can. So that is April 14th. It is not on the card, because we had to change it around, at 1.30. Um, and it's on Highway 42. If you have any questions about where that's located, the chamber can get that to you. Um, and I think I'll leave the rest. No, I'll say these now. First Friday Forum next month, May 2nd. Right here at the Bull, we've got the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance, and we are lucky to have Todd Berry coming to join us. And then June 6th, Trends in Healthcare for the Future, and Dr. Rai will be with us. And if you haven't heard Dr. Rai speak, he is wonderful. Um, and that's not going to be about the Obamacare thing. This is about really about what our health care um, is going to be looking at like in the future. Is that more correctly stated? Yeah. Excellent. So today, we are very, wel very, very welcome to have um, three incredible speakers for our panel. We're going to be speaking about early childhood development. Um, we have Paul Bartlett. He's the CEO and president of the Volrath Company. He has had leadership positions at the Kohler Company and at John Deere. He's been happily married for 23 years to his wife, Beth, and they have two children, a 15 and a 12-year-old. Paul, raise your hand. Yes, good job. We also have Dennis Winters. He's a nationally recognized expert on human resource challenges in the competitive global economic environment. He has served as an advisor to private industry, government agencies, and elected federal, state, and local offices. Dennis Winters' currently, current titles are Chief of the Office of Economic Advisors, Acting Director of the Bureau of Workforce Information and technical support <laughs> and labor market information director for the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development. I do not want to have to put that on his door. That is a lot. That's a big mouthful. He is also happily married, and he is currently reliving his college days vicariously through his three children. <laughs> Got to appreciate that. <laughs> Pam Kugi is our last um, speaker on our panel. She is the principal at the Early Learning Center. She has been the principal. This is her now third year, third year there. And she has been 21 years at the ELC. 
She is happily married with two kids who are 17 and 15. And I have to tell you, so I'm putting a little personal note in this, she is the social worker who diagnosed my son, Eric. Thank you, and welcome. <laughs> Paul, you're up. You get the mic. All right, I feel like uh, it's karaoke time or something, so. <laughs> I'll do my best to, uh, to uh, measure up to the, what was it, a wonderful or fantastic speaker, so we'll see. I'm usually shy, shy on public forums, and those of you that know me don't laugh, please. Um, and never ask me to speak on a Friday, because whatever filter I have is usually gone on a Friday, so this will be fun. But, uh, so I was asked today, I tend to walk around a little bit too, so I was asked today to give the business perspective on uh, early childhood learning and, and literacy. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I've been in this community for 15 years. The company I've worked for, uh, work, that I work for, has been in the community for 140 years. And from a personal and a corporate standpoint, we're very committed to the community. We have been for a long time. We continue to be, and we're expected to be uh, well into the future. But you know, we do have you know some concerns as as we look out in the future, uh, and, and I'll come at it from more of a business perspective about where's our employee base going to come from in the future for folks that we want to hire locally, and then also what kind of community are we going to have to attract people into the Sheboygan County area? Because both of those are very important from a corporate standpoint and from a personal standpoint. We want to be able to grow a business and we want to be able to live and work in a community that we feel safe and is vibrant and is exciting. So I'll kind of share my views on how uh, uh, early childhood learning and literacy fits into that, at least from uh, my corporate viewpoint perspective. You know, so a couple of uh, full disclosure points. I'm a parent, as the introduction said. Um, you know, as, as a parent, my children uh, were direct beneficiaries from an early childhood learning uh, experience in a birth to three range. We had home visiting. You know, sometimes you think that uh, maybe folks that come from a professional environment don't um, uh, really benefit from that. But I'll tell you, some of you probably remember being a first time parent and you're like, where the hell is the instruction manual on this thing? And, uh, you know, I'm really smart, but I feel really stupid with this thing. And, and, you know, that experience of going through it, uh, my wife and I had learned a tremendous amount about the importance of brain development and learning development at that stage. That led, like so many other things in life, I said, wow, this is pretty good. And then I got drafted into helping support early childhood learning, youth development in the community. And so the other full disclosure is I'm kind of on board with early childhood learning, youth development, mentoring, education, so you can't accuse me of being an unbiased uh, speaker on, on this subject. So, but unbiased, uh, I'm not, but I'm also not an expert. I've knocked around uh, in this subject for long enough, and uh, I'll probably use some uh, words that the experts that are on the table will cringe, a little, uh, cringe at a little bit, uh, but I've probably gotten to the point where I, I've reached on the subject, I've reached what I call the Holiday and Express uh, level of competency, if you remember those commercials of, uh, I may not be the expert, but I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> so first, uh, when I'm looking around the room, I gotta do a little bit of a survey here, because um, it's not quite the audience I was expecting. How many people here are involved in government? All right, there we go. How many people are involved in education or child development or youth development? All righty, how many people here actually run a business. All right, those are the people. Oh, now you're calling the nonprofits a business, Bob. Okay. Jeez, okay. All right, so, not that I'm, you know, I'm not even gonna go close and, 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 uh, and try to lecture a lot of the folks uh, governmentally and, and already involved in youth development and uh, uh, education in the room. But, you know, for the business folks in the room, you know, you know, how many of you, this is kind of audience participation time, how many of you locally wish that you had a deeper, broader pool of employees to hire from, right? Yeah, right. Or maybe we're all satisfied. You know, when you recruit um, people into the area, one of the questions that I'm always asked 
by prospective couples with kids is how are the schools? What are the ACT scores? What are the SAT scores? I mean, how many of us would want schools that are even performing at a higher level so people are excited about moving into the area and putting their kids in our educational system? Uh, how many of us donate money to the community to um, help make it a better community? Most of us in the room. How many of us would love to have those dollars spent the most efficiently and the most bang for the buck? I mean, I don't think anybody's going to raise their hand and say, "Hey, waste my money, please." You know, I worked, I worked hard for it. I, you know, I, I gave some taxes to Uncle Sugar, and now let's piss away the. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's Friday. Um, you know, let's get rid of the rest of it. So, you know, I, I, th I think, to me, the subject of the day, early childhood learning, literacy, is something that is a tremendous lever on all four of those things that we can mu move our community forward. And, uh, and, and for the for the uh, business folks and, and manufacturing folks in the room, and I'll, I'll get dinged for my friends for dehumanizing the subject here. But you know, I, I think about child development, our educational system, somewhat in terms of a, of a manufacturing process. A couple things I know, you know, I'm not an educator, but I know manufacturing. The better raw material going into your manufacturing process, the better the output is. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper to make it right the first time and try to rework and fix the product at the end of the process. So how is that tying to the subject of the day? You can all get hired for quality control now. But, you know, at the, at the, uh, I missed my line. One more survey question, then it'll come around. How many of you remember the movie Field of Dreams? You're all old. Um, <laughs> how many of you remember the line from Field of Dreams, build it and they will come? All right, I'll get back to that a little bit. Almost forgot that. Um, so if you think about uh, the kind of the raw material going into our educational process, it's really the kids, you know, depending upon the community you live in, that are, enter are, are entering our educational process at usually age four or five, you know, depending upon uh, the programs that the school systems have. The problem with that is if you look at the research, the most important period in a child's life in terms of brain development, depending upon who, what you look at is birth to three or birth to five. So some of the key times of a children's development is the time where generally speaking as a community, we don't have consistent structured programs focused on the <coughs> development of those, uh, of, of, those, of those children. So what does that matter? Well, and um, I, obviously I'm not killing you to death with PowerPoint, uh, Dennis has a very good PowerPoint that summarizes some of these things, but if you look at the body of research, the development of a child by age five, whether it becomes literacy or their learning development, is a huge predictor, not only of power they're gonna do in school, but the bring on effects of after the K through 12 education. How they're gonna, you know, are they gonna go to a technical college? Are they gonna go to university? Even things that might surprise you, like are they going to go into bankruptcy someday? Are they going to become a social problem that has to be remediated? There's a huge level of predictive power that comes from where a kid has been developed by the age of five. It is one of the biggest levers as a society and as a community that we have to really improve the communities that we live and work in. From a selfish funding standpoint, from a business standpoint, whether it's we're paying taxes or we're donating money. If you look at the data, the leverage, I'll say the financial leverage between remedial social services and preventative social services, such as early childhood education, depending upon what you look at, is safely 10 to one. So the best investment we can make in terms of shifting the community forward is focusing on the front end of the problem, on the quality of the raw material going into the process and not trying to rework issues that have been developed at the end of the process. So that's kind of the, the business owner view of, of, of early childhood education and, and a bit selfish. But if, if you look at all the data, and I'd encourage uh, after the other speakers are done, there'll probably be some uh, reference points in their presentations, but to do a little bit of research and, you know, because obviously at least the three of us our advocates on the subject believe it strongly, but the research out there is compelling and factual and powerful that this is an important lever that we can 
push it in a community. So, um, obviously, uh, I'm a supporter of it. Obviously, I think it's a huge leverage issue for our community. If we commit to youth development uh, and early childhood learning and that whole continuum, over time, we can shi significantly shift not only the employment base in the area, but also the quality of life in our community. But it'll come back to my field of dreams. This, this, this is always a very difficult, and I'll speak now as somebody who's, who's trying to raise money to support these type of efforts, um, preventative um, social action, for lack of a better term, whether it comes from private donations from a, or from a governmental side, um, are tough sells sometimes because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a field of dreams thing. Build it and they'll come. Okay, we're going to invest in kids that are birth two, three, four, five. Well, when do you when do you see that return on investment? You see it 15, 16, 17 years after that. It's not probably an appropriate world word. It's not as sexy as. You know, there's a remedial problem. Somebody doesn't have a house. Somebody's in a bad relationship. Somebody uh, needs food at the food bank or whatever the case may be. And those are all issues we need to address in our community. So I'm not denigrating those, but it's a lot easier to raise money and get people excited either from a taxpayer side or from a private donation side that here's a problem and we can fix it today. You can see an immediate return on your investment. Much more difficult to sell the message about investing in the future, but the returns on that investment and the impact in the community that we live and we work in and from an employee point and an employer point that we, I want to run a successful business in are so huge that we really need to focus on it and from my opinion we need to commit to it from a community basis. So that is my Kool-Aid speech. Hopefully you tasted the Kool-Aid a little bit. Um, hopefully I didn't say anything that made the uh, experts cringe. Uh, they are the experts. I'm just uh, a strong community advocate. So with that, thank you for your time and your attention, and I'll pass it on to Dennis. I may be a little bit expert, uh, but that avenue is pretty narrow, probably. Um, and I've been fairly new to this whole thing. I've only been working on it, uh, early childhood development, that is, for about 10 years. And um, so, but where I've come into it as an economist is from the economic perspective. Uh, and this, and, and some of you in the room know I can talk for ad nauseum on the topic, but um, in the 10 minutes I've got, uh, I'll lay out some what I think are critical points as we look at it from an economic perspective and the return on investment for there because we're trying to change the dialogue a little bit in conversation uh, to go from, pardon the terminology, the warm and fuzzy of the, um, the health care and daycare providers and things like that more into the critical language of the business community and the value on returns on investment and kind of showing it uh, to them. And we've made some progress there because we've been told by uh, folks like Tim Sheehy out of the uh, um, MMAC out of Milwaukee that quit bludgeoning us with data, uh, we get it. Um, tell us what you want from us. So I'm going to bludgeon you with some more data, um, but it's to empower y'all uh, so you can talk a little bit um, intelligently about the, uh, about the concept and what it means. So as we go on in the new economy, uh, uh, economic development, workforce development, are interrelated and interactive, and I would submit that as time goes on, talent is going to be more and more critical for economic development. So I've tried to boil this down into an equation uh, that y'all ought to be able to grasp. Okay, so here we got ed equals ed. Um, education equals economic development, and that will be true uh, more and more in the case, so we have to maximize the education side of things going forward. And to do that, what's the best economic investment tool available? Well, this is it. It's early childhood development. And this is, these numbers are from the uh, Perry Preschool um, project. It was a, it was a controlled, double-blind, uh, statistical experiment. Um, so as scientific as you can get, it took about 136-ish kids out of Ypsilanti, Michigan, put them through, uh, divide them up, and put them through um, early childhood 
care program and those that didn't they measured them they found them again at twenty seven years old i think all but six of them or something like that at forty years old and asked him the same questions and looked at the economic returns on that well it turns out that if you spend fifteen thousand dollars on these kids when they're in uh... four-year-old kindergarten three or four the benefits are two hundred and sixty thousand dollars now that's net present value real terms okay? so it's an apples and apples comparison this is the investment the cost these are where the benefits are spread across that okay? and you've got welfare reduction uh, more education earnings taxes paid and then this huge big one reductions in crime okay? now somebody told me a statistic they said if you don't have a high school degree you're more likely to go to uh, to be incarcerated at some point than you are if you smoke to get lung cancer now uh, that's a pretty bold statement exactly what it means I don't know but if we can make that kind of connection on cigarettes and lung cancer uh, and, and we're doing it worse uh, with our children I would think that would resonate um, at some place so this is a 17 to 1 return uh, Art Rolnack out of the Minneapolis Fed uh, and Rob Grunewald um, brought it down to a 16 percent annual realized rate of return try replicate that year after year after year it's pretty hard to do and I look at this again and uh, my interpretations are a little different but these are some of the uh, things how, how they've um, broken it out um, and the blue lines are those that went uh, or the black lines are those that went through a high quality program in the Perry preschool and, and, the, and the lighter lines is those who didn't and you can see all this uh, you're more likely to be employed you're more likely to make a decent living and what that means for your household and community you're more likely to own a home so you're making a lifetime investment you're putting down roots in a, a community uh, you have an interest in that community you had a savings account from an economic perspective here again um, you're a little ahead of the game you're contributing you are uh, building a source of wealth um, as you go forward and that's critical going forward and then never been on welfare as an adult again it brings down back into social services and the things we need I hear when I ask business people what are the two things that you worry about well, they usually give me three uh, one is too many regulations high tax burden and uh, can't find enough talent well this is a solution to two of those tax burden um, and the talent side of it and the tax burden comes on we were talking at our table a little bit you know the cost of putting a, uh, a kid in in public education right now is about ten twelve thousand dollars per year per kid the cost to do to incarcerate somebody is about thirty thousand dollars per body per year okay which would you rather pay it's kind of a ju judge we used to kind of tongue-in-cheek it when the kid came up in front of the judge where you, you want to go to prison or you want to go to college you know your choice college is cheaper um, and then some other ones an abecedarian another another program I brought these in here because a lot of those returns we talked about are not just long-term returns but they're immediate uh, reductions in special education reductions in grade repeaters more high school and college graduation and we've done some work uh, we'll talk about in a little bit about how this becomes an immediate on the K through 12 network and I just put this one up here you can see all these are big um, benefit cost ratios the point I'm trying to make here though is that all these studies these are scientific studies the different names of them they're all about the same they're all a little different a little different environments a little different programs but they all generated the same similar congruent results which tells me that this is even more powerful for all of these because it's replicated and replicated and even if they're not exact they're showing the same kind of results as we go forward so here's a whole list of them. these are about the big five that we talk about the Perry preschool is kind of the granddaddy of them all uh, so time after time and that's got the biggest results because that's how they track these kids the longest right and so you get the compound returns on it uh, as they get older uh, there was a study out here that again on the short-term stuff the economic returns to Wisconsin's education system um, by Phil or uh, yeah, Belfield and winners put this out a few years ago and it looked at the cash flows through the K through 12 system for the Wisconsin as a whole and for Milwaukee and it broke it down this way the cost 
to do this is about $207 million. It's a big number, right? So where do you get that money? But the benefits in just the fiscal flows, K through 12, is $141 million, okay? And that was because we had fewer grade repeaters, um, um, we needed few, fewer substitutes, there was less teacher absence, on and on and on, okay, of the things that are immediately day to day. And then Clive took this and he extended into the other variables we know that are post-education. Um, this, this yielded us about a 68 cents on a dollar return in the state, about 78 cents for Milwaukee, uh, where they've got um, uh, more problems. And then we put it through the model, we got a 1.64. So every dollar we put in this, we got a dollar 64 cents back. Okay. Positive return on investment, this is as close as we've gotten to home um, for looking at these numbers. So you add all this up, the difference is about $66 million. Still seems like a big number, but it's less than 1%. Less than 1% of the state education budget. Huge return, 17 to 1. The individual and society, 80, per, well, I think that's the next slide. Imperative for workforce development, right, and economic development. And I think in this slide, nope, I'm going to go back here. Um, Huge returns to the individual and society. 80% of the returns go to the community. And go to the, essentially the, the civil population. 20% of that goes back to the individual himself okay, or herself. Huge returns as we go forward and they're spread out. So I kind of sum it up at this, uh, and this is abbreviated uh, off of uh, talks I could give you to explain it more, but what's the greatest job need? What we're hearing all the time from academics and from on the street business people is we need skilled, creative, interactive occupation skills in the people. Okay. Um, what are the returns? 17 to 1, 80% to the public. Huge returns on these investments. Is it fiscally prudent? Tiny fraction of all the money spent in public schools and the return uh, work done um, by Robert Leach. In Wisconsin, it's about uh, eight years before we turn over into actually positive cash flows. Uh, and I say, what is your next alternative investment? Well, it's not a new mall, okay, for economic development. Going forward, it's all going to be about talent. And if you don't have the talent, you're not going to need the mall. I want to tell this story a little bit. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a birth, or actually I'm a prenatal to eight kind of guy. And it's all broken up in zero to three, zero to five, zero to eight. Uh, I'm a prenatal to age eight because the studies out there are showing even um, the prenatal care can affect uh, a child's um, birth weight, uh, not to mention uh, other problems going forward. And the reason I'm birth to eight um, is because as a, as a workforce development consultant, economist, I knew, I'm going to tell this story, I knew that third grade reading scores were a big indicator of academic success. I took that as face value, okay? We know that, we go forward with that. Until one day, my daughter was getting a third grade reading award. And as a dutiful father, I went into class, you know, and I said, I got down in that tiny little chair, um, and the principal comes in. And he says, this is very important. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I gotta get back to work too. But then he goes on to say, because this is very important, because up until now, You've learned to read. From now on, you read to learn. Bing! That's why third grade reading scores, right, are indicative of further future success academic and then economic. That's what brought it all together for me, right? And that's why I'm looking at this thing eight years old. Eight years old is the fulcrum for academic and career success. And that's a lot to ask from a kid coming in in kindergarten doesn't know which way the A is up, right, to get him to read in two or three years. It's a lot to ask from the kid, the teacher, the community, everybody involved. So this is why I tell this story, because this is when it all came together for me, um, physiologically, socially, economically, et cetera, et cetera, okay, the whole package. This is some work done by um, James Heckman, uh, a professor at um, University of Chicago, he's about to retire. This is one of his capstone projects. Um, and he also happens to have a Nobel Prize in economics. 
Uh, and he did some work. He's done, actually done a lot of this work. And if you if you want to find out a lot about everything involved, kind of here on this side, go to HeckmanEquation.com, uh, and there's a whole website out there um, laying a lot of this information out. Excuse me. HeckmanEquation.com, and that's H E H E C K M A N. Um, and one of the things he did is he looked at uh, cognitive and non-cognitive performance scores and, and one of the graphs he's got is this one and, and I'll go through this one this happens to be for math um, but it's true for reading and other things and he laid this out and this doesn't really tell you anything that you probably don't already know this is scores by percentile um, this is age 6 to 12 years old and these are income quartiles okay. so you look at this graph and it says alright well rich kids do better than poor kids Right? And there's, you know, fairly, it gets, the spreads out a little bit more as wealth goes up. Okay? We all kind of know that. We see it uh, day in and day out. Um, in, and we see it in the statistics. But what Professor Heckman did, uh, which kind of sets him apart from a lot of it, is he corrected for the mother's education attainment level. Actually, he corrected for everything else. <coughs> and these graphs came right together. Okay. It's not a function of income level. It's a function of the mother's education attainment level. And when you think about that, it makes a lot of sense, right? This is the first teacher. Who's talking to this kid every day, day in, day out, right? Showing him stuff. So this is where it came together. And a lot of poverty is temporary, okay? So this is where it comes together. It's the mother's education attainment level is the biggest factor in a kid's future. So we, for me, I turned this... And I said, this, we've been doing all the social policy all, well, I'll use the, I'll use the Friday weakness, back ass words, okay? Education is not a function of poverty, but we've been dealing with that. We've been trying to put these kind of programs in for a generation or more. Poverty is a function of education. In the new economy, it's going to be more and more so as we go forward and we see the, the dichotomy going, whether you have talent or you don't have talent in the modern workplace. And if you would have had given me another two hours, I would have laid all that reasoning out for you. But, and I've got a series of quotes now, but this is the one that strikes me. Um, I, and, I, and I've seen David Brooks. Uh, he was a keynote speaker to a, con a convention or a conference we were at in D.C. one time. By five years old, it is possible to predict with depressing accuracy, who will complete high school and college and who won't? Five years old, right? We see it already at that age, and as we talked about, you know, in business you fix it now instead of fixing it later, and we spend billions on remedial education, right? Where you take a kid that didn't do well for 10 years sitting at a desk to listen to somebody, and what do you do? You sit him at a desk and have him listen to somebody to redeem him, right? Doesn't work doesn't work. This is huge. I've got about 12 of these things from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, from the National Association of Manufacturers. Actually, I was talking to um, a woman last week with that WMC in, in Madison um, from the National uh, Manufacturers Alliance, and they've got statements out um, talking about how important this is uh, for business and industry going forward uh, as far as some of them talking about um, national security issues. So that's what I've got prepared. So now that we've heard why early um, education is so important, I'm going to share with you today about, um, I think it's one of the state's best um, early learning centers that we have in the state, um, right here in your own community. Um, it's part of the Sheboygan Area School District, the Early Learning Center. Um, I've gone to many, many conferences throughout the state, and really what we have here in Sheboygan is one of a kind. Um, I don't know that a lot of people living in Sheboygan actually realize that. Um, so we're I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do have here. Um, 
at the early learning center this is an example of our population the people that we serve pretty much any child who lives in the sheboygan area school district attendance area is able to come to the early learning center they can come we have a child find screening at the age of three so any parent can bring their child through a screening and we do a developmental screening to see if they have any special needs and then if they do we do a referral to get them into early childhood education at the age of four children can come and attend 4k so it's the beginning of their school experience at age four they do not need to have any type of need this just breaks down the different students that we have the demographics and then our enrollment at the early learning center we have over 600 students that attend half of the students attend in the morning we have a morning session in an afternoon session it is a half day program and different types of classrooms like I said three-year-olds four-year-olds can be in a self-contained special education classroom if they need that extra help and then we have 16 classrooms that children are receiving regular 4k education we also consult with Head Start where we have a cooperative agreement where they we have two Head Start programs in our building also at the early learning center just listed things that I view as things that we do very successful we have a pyramid model PBIS program which all the schools do in the district we started very young at the early learning center where the children are learning appropriate behaviors for school this also continues in the home and I'll talk about that a little bit later how we get that information out to the parents at the home we give screenings just like other elementary middle and high schools have to do assessments there is a state assessment now that we do give our 4k students and they are compared to other students across the country to ensure that what we're doing they are learning and they need to be where they're at we use a solid curriculum based on the Wisconsin early learning standards we also look at and work closely with the kindergarten curriculum to ensure that what we're teaching the students we're preparing them for kindergarten when they enter kindergarten the other thing I wanted to touch base on is the 21st century skills a lot of people are very surprised that when they walk into our building that the students are already working on iPads smart boards computers it starts very early when they enter school and it's amazing many students come in with those skills already and it's just a tool that we use that they can be educated with and it's very helpful for when they go on because they're going to need that once they go to elementary school and then we are celebrating our 25th anniversary this year we the early learning center has been here for 25 years in Sheboygan it started out it was in two separate buildings and then for the past 19 years we've been at our current location and we're going to be having a big celebration in October where many people will be invited to that to come and celebrate with us the 25 years that we've been here we also have challenges one of the challenges I see is that being recognized at the different levels there are many people in commute in the Sheboygan community I think that still don't really realize and think that it's a daycare setting and it's so much more than that so we've been doing different things at the different levels trying to communicate exactly what we do and what we have here in Sheboygan 
The diversity and the severity of the students that we're seeing um, come into us at age three. I was at lunch, we were in a conversation about um, the mental health needs of students coming in already at age three and how severe that is. 10, 15 years ago, you didn't see a three-year-old coming to our schools already diagnosed with mental health needs. So that is a real challenge and you have to be really prepared to be able to assist those families and those students with those needs. <clears throat> Another huge challenge I think we face is um, figuring out how we provide intervention. When children come to us, we are their first, typically their first school experience. Sometimes they've been in a, pre or a daycare where they've had some type of education there, but um, it's hard to weed out, is it developmental when they come to us and they're not meet, reaching our standards or is it that they really do have some learning issues? So we do have a full-time interventionist <coughs> at our school um, and we are very strategically trying to intervene with students that aren't scoring on standardized instruments where they should be. Um, so that intervention is already beginning at that 4K level. Um, this is just an example of the behavior model. I, like I said, the PBIS system that's in place in all the schools. Um, it starts um, basically, very basic. We teach the students what are appropriate behaviors when you enter school. And then some students respond, the majority of students, 80% of students respond very well to that. Some students need a little bit more intervention and then even a few need even more than that. Um, and we have all that in place what, during that 4K year for them to provide them those assistance in the hope that when they leave our building and go on to elementary school that they know those behaviors. Um, and then we also have an education component for parents where they can learn what's appropriate behavior. That's probably the number one thing that we hear um, as teachers in the school is, I don't know how to control my child's behavior, what can I do? We have lots of different ways that we address it with the parents. Um, one of those ways is through our home visits. We, um, as part of our program, um, which I believe is very important, the research really supports that, is that it's not just having the parents send their children to school. They, a lot of times, need that education component also. Many parents um, send their children to school for the first time and they've had such a negative experience with school from their past experiences that they don't even want to walk in the door. So it's our role to make those parents feel comfortable and let them know that school's a safe place, school's a good place, that they can seek us out um, for that help too. So one of the ways we do that is our students come to school four days a week um, and one, one of the days of the week they do not come to school, our teachers visit with those parents. So each parent will have a visit from their teacher one-on-one -on -one with the teacher and the parent and their child present where we share with the parent what the child is doing at school. We give parents ideas of how they can help their child at home. Um, and that's very unique for our program. I know many other early um, learning centers, early programs throughout the state, they don't always have that component built in. Um, and I think that's key. So the next slide is um, a small video of some examples of how that takes place. You don't think so? Okay. We can just watch it. So basically here, the teacher is going over with the child um, a learning activity that took place in school. You don't see yet, but the father is sitting right next to him.
And in this particular video, they ask the father, um, what makes these visits important to you? Why do you, what do you like about these parent-teacher visits? He basically says that this particular child, his child, um, the first couple weeks of school did not want to come to school, was crying, it was a very hard separation. He had never been in a daycare, been away from parents. Um, and by the fourth, fifth, sixth week of school, he loved coming to school, um, all was good. So, And the dad had, did say too that he enjoyed this because he was able to take something home with him. At every visit, we are able to give the parents something that they can take home to work on that's similar to what we're doing. I guess in ending, I would invite anybody that hasn't been to the Early Learning Center, if you'd like to come through, take a look, see what we have to offer right here um, in Sheboygan. It's a wonderful facility, lots of learning, lots of education going on. So thank you.
personally believe the results are mixed on that. And I think if you're overall concerned about where kids are when they graduate at age 18 out of high school, I would look at more why our kids get so much worse in international tests between fourth grade and 12th grade than what's going on between four, before fourth grade. Because right now our kids internationally do very well in fourth grade. I'm sure you see up in the front disagree with me, but I want you to be aware of this is a, a, a there are disagreements on this and there's another side. Thank you for your side. Do you want to address that? Um, <coughs> sir. Um, I, I agree with you in the sense that uh, we get our kids up to speed early and it fades. And I agree with you that you have to follow through on the investment to keep those kids at premium level, uh, both for, for their own good and for um, competition globally. Um, as far as, <coughs> um, um, I'm trying to think what other point you made there um, that I did have a, 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 a bit of a a, a bit of a problem with, but... The idea that American kids collectively do well. Oh, yes, thank you. International fourth grade tests. <clears throat> right. It's after that that they go down. Well, and, and, and Professor Heckman would tell you that he started out this whole, uh, uh, call it an initiative, uh, he was looking at the um, narrowing of America's competitiveness versus the globe. Uh, and he looked at R&D investment. Didn't find the problem there. He looked at our graduate schools. Didn't find the problem there. Looked at our colleges. Didn't find it. High schools. Didn't find it. Elementary schools. He had to drill all the way down to early childhood development, where he found the beginnings of the discrepancies uh, in the uh, relative uh, gains or loss, whatever you want to look at it, of America's competitiveness. So he's he started out um, looking at the top end, ended up at the bottom. If you want to do it by age. Uh, in reverse. So, um, I, I, I just, you know, I'm going to chime in and add to that a little bit. Part of what makes America great is we all can have different opinions and we can respectfully disagree. You know, I, I, uh, I would say, you know, I would, first of all, we should go and have a beer sometime together and you know, go back and forth. But, you know, I, I, to me, one of the flaws in the logic here, 
I'm not going to start over, but um, based on this news release, there's $500,000 that's going to be available to work with um, organizations that develop public-private partnerships around early education. Um, and there was no more information on how we might be able to apply for some of that $500,000. Do you know anything about that? I, I do know a little bit. I mean, the race to the top was a big grant um, that we got. I think uh, 21 million, and then 11 million uh, onto that. So there, the Department of Children and Families has got a program to try to develop uh, initiatives for that. A lot of it goes into um, the uh, longitudinal data system out of DPI. But um, out of the era money, the American Recovery and whatever Act. Um, that came out of um, the, the meltdown, the economic meltdown, there was money put forward to, and we got a slice of it. I say we, I work with some folks to develop private-public partnership, and we've, we've got about $300,000 of that, of which um, we let just about all of it out in matching grants through the um, Celebrate Children Foundation. And we put the grants out that they had to be matched at, um, half, 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, we had 16 recipients that won awards. It turned out that the matching came in at over one to one. So the communities that we put it out to uh, rallied even more resources than we expected. Um, so I asked for $2 million out of that race to the top for public partnerships, or at least I suggested it should be to that level, and we've got, what did you say, 500,000. So. Um, we're hoping we can, we can leverage that money as well uh, as we did the previous money um, the, and exactly when all that's going to be, you know, let out and, and awards um, received and granted, I don't know. Thank you. I, I have a question uh, and that is regarding English as a second language. I noticed some of your statistics dealt with that, but how does that play into the early, you know, learning? language or English as their second language. They come to the Early Learning Center and they are given a language test and they are given a level when they enter the school district. One, two, three, or four. Most of the children coming in at age three or four, when they speak another language other than English, are given a level one. Um, and then they are able to get extra services within the school district um, by an ELL teacher, which is certi a certified teacher. Um, so they can enter and get those extra services right away. Parents also have the right, if they don't want those services, to sign them out of that. But 99% of parents will take it. Speaking to the, we talked a little bit about the 30 million uh, word gap uh, of kids that are between the kids who have been read to and cuddled and nurtured and those that hadn't. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to that and someone uh, on, and explain how that, that works with regard to you know, brain stimulation and the development of the brain? I just took the microphone out of your hand. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Well, I, I'd say I could do my Holiday Inn Express thing, or, or I could pass it on to speaker number four, who would be, uh, or questioner number four. Do you want to speak of this speaker number four? <laughs> I'm Luann Travis. I'm the executive director of the Family Resource Center. The Family Resource Center has a home visitation program that's here in Sheboygan County for the last 15 years called Parents as Teachers. It's an evidence-based, oh, there's good nods out there, good. Um, it's an evidence-based program that dials it back 
to what I call early learning. I think that one of the most important things that we need to do here is we need to distinguish between early learning and early education. Everything about today was about early education, the four-year-olds, the five-year-olds. And I think Paul hit it spot on when he said the raw material. I used to teach before I got into this position. I taught first grade back in the mid-80s, so please do your math. And even at that time, we saw the gap. We saw the gap between those who came to school with and without skills, without the readiness skills. I can only imagine how it has increased through the years. And I taught at a private school, and uh, it's kind of amazing, Paul, sometimes you and I line up and without thinking before we even talk about it. I would come home and I'd say to my husband, it's all about the raw material. It's all about what is handed to me. I could teach these kids on a dirt road, the kids I was getting. I would guarantee that I could teach Paul's kids when they came into my system on a dirt road. Now we need internet access on that dirt road. <laughs> okay? But I could teach them based on everything they got from zero through four. And my um, home visitation program at the Family Resource Center is getting a parent educator into the home from the time the child is born. Because I agree to a point that we can take children out of their learning environment in their home and put them in daycare, and we can put them in four-year-old you know, kindergartens. We can pull them out of this home and put them in three-year-old kindergartens. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, children go home, and they go to parents. And the home is the first classroom, the most influential classroom. How many speeches do you have to listen to? Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Most influential. Mom, Dad. But the problem we have in our world, in our culture, is that we do not recognize the parent as the teacher, and nor do we engage them until they hit the early learning center. Four years old, and now we're going to work with you parents. We're going to engage you in education. And we need to engage parents immediately from the time that that child is born. And to tell you the truth, that's a great window of opportunity because when you got that baby in your hand, you're looking for that manual. I mean, parents are very impressionable at that time. They really want to know how to do this. They'll learn the behaviors you're talking about at four years old. Those parents had those questions when the kid was two years old. How do I deal with these parents? How do I deal with this type of behavior? That's enough for my area. I wish that the home visitation program across the state, home visitation program, is only being used for those at-risk families, only those parents who need it. It's not being used for first-time parents. And I can tell you right now, I can identify about four first-time parents in this room who have used home visitation because they saw a good tool and they said, I want the best for me, and I want the best for my kid. Ideally, home visitation should be first-time parents throughout all of Sheboygan County has access. That's what it should be. That should be our norm here in Sheboygan County, so that when that raw material turns up at the four-year-old program, we've got great raw material. And we're not pulling kids out of homes. The 30 million word gap, real quick, because I have a feeling I might be I'm pinching upon number five, and I'm sorry. The 30 million word gap, real quick, is a 1995 study that you can look up, uh, R-I-S-E-L-Y, Ricely and Hart. Um, NPR has had that study on many times. And just Google 30 million word gap. In fact, Chicago has a great um, initiative about the 30 million word gap. They're ahead of us. Um, it is saying that it studied 45 families from various social economic levels and they meticulously, get a load of this, went into each of those families' homes and they recorded an hour worth of conversation. And they went back to their little laboratories and they counted every single word. You guys are going to predict what happened. The child that came from Paul Bartelt's home, from most of our homes, has 30 million more words than the child who comes from the lower socioeconomic class. So you come to four-year-old kindergarten, and you look at that, Susie Johnny has 30 million less word exposure, vocabulary, early, early literacy skills. So 
when you talk about what are the signs of spring, I have a feeling, Joe, your kids could tell us all about the daffodil, about photosynthesis, about the warming up of the earth, while maybe this other child could say, flowers come in spring. That's good, flowers come in spring. Who's gonna have more success as reading, okay? And by the way, those socioeconomic kids that were lower were not neglected, they were not abused. Their, care, their parents cared about them. They nurtured them. They just didn't have that middle class, upper middle class learning style. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Can you have the mic up? You know, the uh, discussion about uh, the academic angle of uh, whether the Perry study is accurate or not was very interesting. But I think we have an opportunity here with 25 years at the Early Learning Center. Is there any effort or idea to actually study the outcome of the children that have benefited from your program and see what we're doing right here, which really matters to me, more so than the, the academic world? I almost won't give you the microphone because I want to answer that. <laughs> um, yes, we are it, always in the process of looking back at our data. Um, looking at data to drive our instruction, where do we go with it? Um, are we going to research the, p the past 25 years? No. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the children who are 28 years old now, compared to uh, somewhat equal control groups that just went to kindergarten without being That kind of comparison on um, where they are now at 28 years old, 27 years old, see if it really made a difference. I was going to say, maybe something that would be really exciting this year, is seeing as how it is their 25th anniversary, is maybe as a community, we should be asking for an open house day when those kids can come back and write about their successes in the book. I didn't need it anyways, right? Um, that would give you a lot of, you know, a lot of that information. And I know I said I was going to let you talk, but uh, I'm going to talk now. So um, I did say in the beginning that Pam was the social worker on my son's case. Um, my son is now 17 and a half year old, years old, and when he went to the ELC, he did not speak. He would say the word gi. Anybody have a question what that they think that might be? Gi. Yeah. It's really a hard one, huh? He was asking for a cookie, but because his, he had a, a, a hearing loss during a developmental stage, he didn't get the k part out of it, and he'd only get the gi part. My husband has a PhD, and I have a bachelor's degree with a, train, a, a technical degree after that, and I own my own business. So it wasn't about our economic development. It was that we were first-time parents who were a state away from our parents, and every six weeks we saw our parents, and they said, was, you know, there's something wrong. And we went, we understand him just fine. We knew better, right? First time parents, we had no clue. But it took one of my very dearest friends to say to me, I'm going to ruin our friendship today. There's something wrong and if you never speak to me again, I'm okay with it. Okay, um, I'm program director for the chamber and I'm gonna throw out a little bit of a challenge. I think we need to do a program like this again later in the year and I'm gonna challenge each of you with the, if it's a 17 to one return on investment, to bring 17 friends that aren't here already. And maybe we address the early learning challenges, we address some of the other challenges in learning. And we, the, the comment that was made about parents, we've had lots and lots of discussions about how do we get to the parents? How do we get them involved with what's going on? And if, if we multiply the audience, maybe we'll catch something, we'll catch a wave, we'll catch whatever, and just get the message around our communities so that people really do understand the, the really significant importance of this. So, and the other person that I want to thank is John, because John was the one who suggested that we do this. John and Dennis had a conversation in November before the first Friday Forum in November, and John came to me afterwards and said, we have to do an early learning program. So John, thank you. I think we
we are really seriously out of time. I think we went way over, because I looked down at Joe's phone, and it said 127 a long time ago. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again. I'm sorry we've run over, um, but it was a really wonderful conversation.